I do have a bit of an agenda that I would like to accomplish um, tonight and, and uh, the next time around. But I also want to make sure that um, your questions are also included in what that is. So I thought we'd start there tonight with if you have just, you know, what is this, what is that, these kind, you know, what's that about kinds of questions. And we'll write those down and then um, that'll help. Um, help me to pay attention to what it is that um, uh, I need to answer, Martin might help. Um, and then um, we can kind of think that through and just, just so that we don't forget where, where the questions are and what the questions are about. So do you have any of those kinds of questions? And we can keep doing this. We don't have to, you know, we can keep going through the, through the night. We, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just jot things down as they come up. But do you have any as we start? Son and Holy Ghost. Well, should I write that? Uh, I mean, what is, have you, okay, so I'm going to put, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that either. down as a as a particular. But I also um, what that also brings up is um, why do we do some of the things we do? I mean, yeah. where where do some of those things come from? Yeah. I'm so glad you yeah. asked that because <laughs> I have something right along the same yeah. lines. Yeah. Right before the gospel reading. Oh, I do the secret language. Yeah, yes, that's so great. I want to know what that's about. <laughs> I mean, I've got secret, <laughs> secret handshakes. Uh, yeah, but secret decoder ring. <laughs> I saw, I always struggle. Should I fake it? No, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, no. I, don't know, I don't know if I'm going to do it right, so I better ask. And I keep thinking those, I should ask. See, then those I are keep, great, great things. I keep holding back because yeah. I don't want to act yeah. you don't want to sound. Yeah. Well, and I think another, another part that goes under here are questions of piety. That's a word that I use to describe things like, why or should I stand up for this prayer? And should I kneel down for that? Why are we doing these things? And those are, um, uh, that's all has to do with posture, but it has to also do with piety. And piety is a word that describes, for me, what it describes is um, how I learned some stuff and what that's attached to. And therefore, why is that important to me? Why don't I genuflect when I enter a pew? That's, that's part of this for me. Why do I stand when I pray and kneel when I confess? Those, that's all part of, of this sort of stuff. And, and those are, you know, those are, those are questions of, you know, I don't want to be the only one. Mm -hmm. So I, we can, we I ask. think I'm silly. <laughs> the year the Episcopal Church was founded, and how does that relate to, like, the Lutheran and Okay, so you're, you're asking a little bit about history. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, the Episcopal founding. Church history. That means I have to come up with a date. That's attached. Well, well, My history is all narrative. That's all. That's all the story. And why the Episcopal And church? why? Okay. You know, was it the acceptance? Was it? Those are good. And I actually have that stuff on the history stuff is on my is on my agenda. And I want to know if I'm accurate when people ask me, well, what's Episcopal? I haven't heard of that. Okay. I say it's a relaxed version <laughs> of, the, of the, um, Catholic I do it, church. Yeah, yeah. Of the Catholic okay. Church. We're not quite as strict as Lutheran. <laughs> so we're great. The, so yeah. I need to find out the so right way Great to say questions. That. Bill calls it Catholic light. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that. <laughs> and why the word Episcopal? Oh, good. 
article of a blog the other day about sharing the peace. <laughs> and peace run amok. Hmm. Well, and I think there's a lot of depth to it mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't realize. And it was a it was a really good refresher for me to read that intent of why we share the peace of Christ. But what really surprised me, and I know you all think I know everything, was when the block, Scott Gunn said that there's an alternate place to do the peace. Yes. And I'm like, is. what? Yes. There what? Is. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I had to get out my prayer book and, and take a look take at a look it. because I've never seen it done where he said you could do it done. Yeah, That's I, not right. I actually yeah. have seen it done in no. the alternate position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How I mean, about, um, so, so that's a liturgy kind of question? The receiving of communion. I before you accept it. Okay. Good, 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 too. Good more than the whole list and that's not on my list so we will do that so don't if you if other things come up you know say them even if they feel off topic and we can write them down so we so we know to come back to them or don't you could just come on up and write them down yourselves too that would be just fine the place I do want to start tonight is sort of that um, going back I want you to think about two things and they are probably related for you. I am an Episcopalian. And I am at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. Um, both of those are because maybe. But um, I want you to I want you to think about those and, and um, you know what what are the what are the what are the reasons? My son Tom has been writing. Tom, my son Tom writes a really good blog. It's called Speaking of Bones. Um, and he's been addressing these two questions recently quite in depth. Um, why, why do I continue as an Episcopalian? What's that important? Why is that important to me? And, um, and I think that's a really important question. We might not, and I think the answer changes over time, and that's just fine. Um, but I think, it's a, I think it is a good question. A good thing to ponder. I'm an Episcopalian because, and uh, I'm at St. Andrews because. Is anybody ready? Ready to share an answer? Yeah. yeah. Might not be fully formed, but go for it. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I was raised Catholic my mom and dad and uh, when Annette and I got married Annette was pregnant and the Catholic Church did not want us to be married in the church you know, or it was a decision of a pastor to have the baby which would have been Nikki and give her up for adoption and I didn't agree and you know we've been married 32 years now and we have great grandchildren you know a lot of things and for a while there, you know, we, I felt um, the religion had let me down. It was a pretty selfish decision at the time. But as Nikki got older, I wanted to go back into the church and let her have a choice and experience and not in her life the way that I did. <clears throat> and so Annette's aunt actually had invited us. We, we searched through three or four different churches. And, um, I just felt like you could come as who you are to this and be who you are. And it was more inviting for us at the time to bring you out of the church. That's because I don't That was like totally different than my answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, one of the um, reaffirming things for me with the Episcopal Church is um, they really do accept people who they are, no matter male, female, color, background. Uh, we had a couple of people that were passing away and I asked Father Ed if, if he wouldn't mind if he came with me. And, you know, we uh, did some personal things and um, brought people into the church so that they felt like they had a place before they passed away. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to, to get baptized and to see God in your life. It wasn't about who are we when we come through a door for 60 minutes or 90 minutes, but who 
speak more and invite more people into what I believe in and what I felt comfortable with. And I don't have all the answers like the priest did to not wanting us to get married, but I do know that there's a lot of good people around that I can always turn to, you know, when it's more of a community thing. So and uh, that's how I view who we are at Tucson and who So many people do come to the Episcopal Church from another denomination or they're searching for, but I'm the child of two Episcopalians, you know, so that's my, both of my parents were raised Episcopalians and so that's where I started. Um, when we moved here to Rapid, we went to Emmanuel because my folks knew people there and I had to laugh because Margaret ran a she saves everything. <laughs> but she had a bunch of old pictorial directories from when they went to, to Emmanuel also. <laughs> so I'm looking through them. And it always listed the Garwood family as members, but we never had our pictures. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we were like, we were members, but not, you know, really a part of the community, I guess. And, and uh, then when my grandfather came to live with us in probably the early 80s, my mom worked nights, and um, she would get off at 7, and Gramps was an 8 o'clock person, and so it was too far for her to get from the hospital home out here on the west side of town and get back out of town to Emmanuel. So she started bringing Gramps here, so I think kind of we segued over here. I was in that young adult phase where I wasn't going to church, and it wasn't until 
I didn't, I mean, and I came here off and on, but not on a regular basis, but it wasn't until after my folks had retired and my mom and dad's best friends, um, he died. And I went to the funeral at Emmanuel and, um, then I didn't think Mary Ann should have to go to church alone, you know, so I, I would go with her and I went with her for probably maybe three weeks and she finally said to me, you know, I can go to church by myself. Oh, <laughs> well then I was kind of cut adrift and so I just kind of came over here and there was Connie Edstrom that I'd known since I was a child and Margaret whose kids I'd gone to high school with and Shelly who I'd gone to high school with and so it, it felt natural but it, so that's kind of how I became a, really a member here was that through connections of people that I knew. And I was very comfortable coming and just eight o'clock, sitting in my pew, minding my own business. <laughs> <laughs> and tell. Oh. <laughs> Connie Edstrom. How many notice? It's an alter guild thing. My alter guild partner's going out of town. Could you help me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Quick slide to mm -hmm. participation and involvement. Well, I, too, um, am a product of a Lutheran and a Catholic. Um, my mom won, and so we um, attended the Catholic Church always, all of us, every Sunday. Um, and I actually loved that. I, I have very fond, fond memories and feelings of being a little Catholic girl. Um, Part of it was because I think um, my mom would not send us to Catholic school, <laughs> so uh, we were all in public school, and we went to, um, I went to, um, when I was very little, we had Saturday morning um, catechism, and then eventually Wednesday afternoon, and then eventually um, Sunday evening youth group, and uh, we even had the release time where we would miss part of our Wednesday and go have instruction, which I find fascinating today if that ever, mm -hmm. that ever flew. Um, but I, I, I just do have very fond uh, memories of, of all of that, I, I, just that I was, I was included and that was okay. Um, my mother will tell you that when I, was an eight, when I was eight, I turned to her and told her I was going to be a priest someday. Um, and I, I do not know how those kinds of thoughts get into a little Catholic girl's head at all, but clearly they did because that's what mom says. Um, so when I, uh, let's see, Rick and I met, and he was raised in the Evangelical Free Church. No dancing, no cards, no nothing. And so um, when he reached the age of reason, uh, which was when he got his driver's license. He uh, left <laughs> to find his own way, and he did. He found a, he, he ended up in the Congregational Church, and he really liked that. And and it was a it was a his was a wonderful church. Um, and so he and I met, and uh, we we went to both churches. Um, and sometimes we went to both churches on Sunday mornings. We'd go to one of them and then the other one. <laughs> we, they weren't very far apart, so, so that worked just fine. Um, and we did that for a long time. Well, not a long time, because our courtship wasn't very long. We did that throughout our entire courtship. And um, when it became clear to us that we were going to be married, um, we, we um, invited, it's, uh, we decided to get married in, in the church I was raised in, in the Catholic Church, and the priest at that time was great buddies with the pastor at Rick's church, and so um, he came on over, and we did this wedding, and, um, and uh, up until the communion part, um, we were just all, all together in on this, but my priest, who is a wonderful man, and I think, had it been up to him, it wouldn't have been this way. But um, he said, I can't. I, I can't invite everyone to communion. So, um, so we had communion the night before the wedding party. And the, some of our family at the, in the rectory with 
sitting in front of the fire, and it was just a wonderful, a wonderful um, experience. And I preached. Um, so, so we, you know, we were at home in in that place, and, and that was good. But we also realized that children were on the horizon, and going to churches every Sunday morning was really a crazy sort of thing. So, what do we do about that? And we thought, well, we could look and see what's out there. I didn't really know much about the Episcopal Church. But four months before we were married, my friend Robin, childhood friend, was married, and she was an Episcopalian, and she went to St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And I was in her wedding, and uh, that was a really amazing experience, being in her wedding. You know when you're an attendant for somebody's wedding, it isn't usually in a spiritual experience. I, I, I liked... Now that I do that, I, you know, I really like to make that some sort of a, you know, an inclusive and a, and a good, at least a good experience. Um, and so when Rick and I thought about where we would go to look for, for a church, um, that was just, you know, pretty, pretty clear that that's the place we would start. And so we went to St. Luke's Episcopal Church one morning, and the rector, George Martin, um, saw us, remembered from us from that wedding, and, had, and said, I was wondering when you were going to be back here. <laughs> and um, we never left. That was the only place we ever went. Um, and, and I felt uh, like I had come home, that my spirit was, was fully alive and fully aware and fully welcome in that place. Um, within months of that, um, George um, handed me the Book of Holy Orders and said, you know, you need to think about this. I had um, started on a master's degree in theology from the College of St. Catherine um, just because I, I, I needed to. It, it was one of those sort of compulsion things. I didn't know what, I, what that was about or why I was going to do that, but I did it. And um, it was a while. That, uh, it, was an, it was years, I mean, because... Yeah, we had two kids, and <laughs> and uh, you know all of that. I was the Christian education person at St. Luke's for a few years, and the next rector, actually, that was two rectors later, um, uh, finally said to me, "You can't say no to this anymore. You need to do this." <laughs> so that's when that's when we uh, picked up our our stakes and moved off to Austin, Texas, and went to St. I got here to St. Andrews because um, the people of St. Andrews wanted me here, and um, that's a, a pretty humbling experience. Um, the way I hear the story, and Marty might be able to tell you a different side of that story, um, is that is that I, you know, I came to uh, to be interviewed. Rick and I and the kids, we all all came to be interviewed, and um, we really liked it here. And as we went home, we looked at each other and we thought, well, you know, if they want us to come here, we really think we can do this. We, we can, because you know, we had sworn we would never move. Um, but we we uh, we decided together that we we thought maybe we could do this if St. Andrews wanted us to. And, um, got the call, um, and uh, and it it took a long time. <laughs> And what I came to learn was that the people of St. Andrews went to bat for me. Um, went to um, the bishop. The bishop had decided on somebody else. And, uh, and these folks told the bishop that they wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> a road trip, a face-to-face -face conversation by some of the people with the bishop. And, um, which was in and of itself, an amazing experience because um, you, you could probably feel the, the Holy Spirit moving in decisions that were made. And it, when, we, when they, the search committee said they wanted to call Kathy and the bishop said, well, no, because I don't think she's experienced enough, you will start over. Well, it had already been a two-year process. And um, it was just this upheaval, <laughs> you know, and 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 it it was about four people that piled in a car and drove to Sioux Falls and met with the bishop and drove home and and uh, the bishop 
listened. And Kathy was called. And how many years ago was that? Uh, my first day here was January 2nd, 2004. <laughs> and Father Bill had retired June 30th, 2002. <laughs> so that's how I got here. Well, um, I was raised Catholic, but only kind of, sort of, <laughs> if that makes sense. Without going into a lot of detail, um, you know, we would go, and then we would not go, and then we would go, and then we would not go. And um, I think most of the time we went, it was because um, my father felt like that's what we were supposed to do that's what you do but I don't think he ever really felt anything when he was there and but you know we we had to um, make our first communion go through confirmation classes but in between I mean we went years without going so I don't really feel like I lived it like some families live it but I, I attended and I don't know how else to say it but um, my mother's background was, I'm going to say this, and I don't, I, this is not a slam, but really big family in the woods of West Virginia, kind of hillbillies, and um, her father was quite elderly when she was growing up, and he used to read from the Bible and whip them and scream at them. And I think he might have had mental problems. I'm not sure. But I don't think she ever wanted anything to do <laughs> with being in a church. <laughs> and so with, there were never major battles about going to church. But you could always sense she didn't really want to be there. And my dad was kind of insistent that we go. So then for long periods of time, when he kind of relaxed, she... So we, we didn't... We weren't committed wholeheartedly, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So when it was time to get married, but you know, I had gone enough that, well, I don't know, but Bill has been an Episcopalian his whole life. And so when we were getting married, for whatever silly reason, I, th I really wanted to be married outdoors. We used to spend a lot of time outdoors. That's really what it, where I wanted to be married. But of course, the Catholic Church would not do that. And I, it wasn't a, the church that I went to when I was little. I hadn't been there for years. So it wasn't like I had a relationship with anybody in that church. And Bill was living here and I was living in Ohio. So we just, I don't know how he contacted somebody in an Episcopal church in Ohio. But we went and we met the priest. And he was this really young guy. And right away I liked him. <laughs> and um, because I just liked him, I still wasn't feeling real pulled in. But... Um, but I, I liked him, and I knew that's who I wanted to marry us. So then I moved here after we got married, and um, we didn't start going. Bill had been living here, so he had been going, and he was pretty friendly with Father David because they're close in age, and they just had things in common. So um, I don't really think I started going until we started having our kids. It's kind of like going back to my dad. You know, I didn't have a strong pull feeling that I had to be in church, but yet here I am with my first child thinking, I have to have this child baptized. I, you have to do it because you have to do it, I guess. I like, you think it's a stepping stone of life for some reason. So that's, and then I really liked Father David. And then as I started having more kids and we started being at Emmanuel a lot, then I started to really like it. And then I had made friends and I enjoyed the service. And I then I started to, really enjoy being there and then Father David left and we tried to go for a while and it just didn't feel the same it just did not have that same feeling of why we were there and um, it, it wasn't like there was anything wrong it was just wasn't right and so we left for a while and then again we thought well we gotta go you know a year passed we gotta go to church somewhere <laughs> Then we tried another church, a Lutheran church, which that one was really off base for both of us. But that was not so much the church as it was the circumstances of how we were trying to, to fit it into 
our life, it just, wa it just wasn't a good schedule. And so we ended up here. Um, Dave was so good with my oldest son because, you know, my oldest son is the kind of kid who, especially when he was younger, adults could either, he could really get on their nerves <laughs> and they don't want him to be there because he's hyper or they just embrace it because they see just how his enthusiasm is just wonderful if you accept it as being wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, there weren't a lot of, I always was worried we were going to, you know, we we're going to get in trouble and stuff, but Dave was never like that. Dave always just redirected him in such a positive way and he always gave him an outlet for that energy and and so Dave was here and that's how we started coming here and I've never been in a church where I've enjoyed being there so much as here because I just um, I look at those ads in the paper that say welcome home and especially when I first started coming here and I'd look in the paper and I'd see that and I think gosh that's how I feel <laughs> so I, I don't know <laughs> Thank you. Judy, any, any, uh, anything you want to say, Tiana? Oh, I can't, I can't say any here. <laughs> and that, that is a legitimate, yeah, a legitimate answer. Yep. Is there anything you um, particularly like about it, maybe? Um, is there anything that if you had the power to change it, it would change? You think of something, let me know. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that, um, you know, there's Lutherans. We've talked about Lutherans. We've talked about Catholics. We've talked about um, evangelical free church people. Um, and one of the one of the questions um, that we may ask ourselves um, and that others ask us is, of course, so what? What does it mean to be Episcopal? And, and the reality is that it is a hard question to answer. Um, so I can, I, can, um, I can say a couple of things about that. You ha we have this question, what is Episcopal? What does the word mean? And the word Episcopal is <coughs> of the bishop, which doesn't get us anywhere. The word itself. Episcopal is of the bishop. So you can talk about an <clears throat> episcopacy. So that's sort of the, the bishop's the bishop's tenure as a bishop is an episcopacy. Um, you can talk about an episcopal election, and that is 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 uh, electing a bishop. Um, so the word itself means of the bishop. So it really doesn't get us anywhere. Is the bishop in um, Latin papal? Mm, no, no, no. It doesn't. It is not Nothing. related to the word to to, okay. to uh, um, so the word the that bishop. means pope. Yeah, it is of the bishop. So, um, so another part then of that answer has to do with uh, another word, which is we will get to which is polity. And that's a word that means how we are structured, how, how we are put together. So uh, we'll talk a little bit, because that, that has everything to do with bishop, how we are put together. None of that, and we're going to get to that sort of stuff in a, in a little bit, but none of that is really about who we are. So uh, that, that's the place I want to spend, um, I think, the rest of our time today, is, is who we are. And, I, and, I, and one of the answers, and my answer to that question, has everything to do with this. You can talk about Lutherans. And the word we use to, to describe that is confessional. The Lutherans are confessional. They, um, they confess a particular and a certain way of understanding the world. And the, what, one of the ways is, a, is something we call sola scriptura, which means by the scripture alone. And it's another um, um, 
it's a re reformed tradition so so by its very nature is is reformed from what came before it and what came before it is what came before all of us and that is Catholic um, and then you ha then you have Catholic and we experience Catholic um, many of us experience Catholic by sort of a list of stuff a list of a list of things you assent to in order to be Catholic you have you have to believe this and this and this and this which isn't different from sort of being evangelical the litmus test is just a little bit different and by Catholic you mean Roman, Roman Catholic. Catholic because that's you know, another and, difference well and when I came into the Episcopal Church I had never heard anybody called Roman Catholic I was a Catholic I had never heard a, what, anything like that. So when I joined the Episcopal Church and I started hearing um, that referred to as Roman Catholic, I thought, what's that about? I had no idea I was a Roman Catholic. I just thought I was a Catholic. Um, so so I, what I don't want to do is to define us against um, the others. What I want to do is to say who we are and who we are as people of this book. Um, in our Book of Common Prayer, um, so one of the criticisms of a, being Episcopalian is that is you know where's your Bible, and the reality is is your Bible is all right in here. <laughs> that that um, most of what we pray together is completely and absolutely from our scriptures. Um, we read as we gather together on Sunday mornings. We read at least four pieces of scripture. Sometimes, I, it's been a long time since I've gone to another denominational church service, but my experience is that it's often maybe one sentence of scripture. <laughs> um, so we are a people of common prayer and a people of scripture. In this book, what, what it contains for us is the opportunity to gather in prayer. That's who we are. Is that book the same as the common mm -hmm. prayer? Oh. This, this mm -hmm. book and that book are the very same book. Yeah. I just have in the back of my book the hymns. So mine's a prayer book hymnal combination. But it's, you know, that's, that's really neither here nor there. Once again, we are... We are people of common prayer. So when we gather together, that's one expression of who we are. When we gather together um, for a Sunday morning service or a Saturday evening service or a Wednesday morning service or whenever it is we gather together, what we do together is pray. We say our prayers together. Those prayers are, are prayers that take a particular form. Um, but that's who we are, is people who pray together. And at the center of the prayer that we hold together is this amazingly thing, amazing thing we call Eucharist. Another big word. And that word means Thanksgiving. So at the center of what we do together in our prayer is thanksgiving. And the symbols of that thanksgiving is the broken bread and the wine that we share. We talk a lot, well, people like me talk a lot, about, about what's really happening there. And there have been these doctrinal and academic conversations and fights throughout history talking about oh these you can if you remember these words you can really really impress people <laughs> your spelling is really good tonight i'm making it all up as i go so that's belt right transubstantiation the other word is consubstantiation i don't even care about those two words when <laughs> that means when the body of Christ that that means what is happening 
when we break that bread and drink that wine? What is really happening? And all I know about what is really happening is that Christ is present in a real way. And I believe that with every fiber of my being, that Christ is present in a real way. Christ is present in that bread that is broken. Christ is present in the wine that we drink. Christ is present in the people that gather shoulder to shoulder to support each other. Christ is present when I believe with every fiber of my being that I know what's happening here. And Christ is present when I just do not get it. When I feel so awful about myself that I can't believe that Christ's body would ever be broken for me. It doesn't matter how I feel. <laughs> what matters is that this is real. This is a real thing that we do together. This is a real thing that God makes happen in our lives. And we have this amazing privilege of participating in it. And in that participation, we are made whole. All of the fragments of our lives, all of that brokenness, is brought back together again and made whole. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's transubstantiation or common substance. <laughs> I know it's real. I know that there is a real presence of Christ. Not only right then, but as we walk outside these doors and carry that, we carry that real presence with us. Christ's presence in our lives and in all of the lives. It doesn't even matter if you've been in church. I think Christ is still present there. But I think there is a there is a, a, a an amazing thing that happens when we gather together. Go ahead, Jeff. That's a very humbling moment for me, standing mm -hmm. at the altar. And I I don't know if in, I'm impeding on people, but I do look around mm -hmm. and how people's hands are willing to accept that it. it's yeah. it's humbling. It's very Thanksgiving, and I never really felt that way when I received outside of this mm -hmm. church, because it's, I don't know, a few months ago, I, I was just listening to, you know, one of your sermons about how we all come together, and we're really alive because we all pray together, you know, to me, that's just, it's just a very sacred moment. And that's the amazing thing about taking communion to the hospital or to the shut-ins. Oh, yeah. When we, you know, send yeah. people forth, you know, we say this prayer, and, you know, communion in community is going to the hospital to deal with some. It really, really is. <laughs> you know, it really is. It's it's that gathering together. We're, we're taking that presence of Christ and we're, when I go to the hospital, I'm taking Annette's presence and Jeff's presence and Kathy's presence and Fiona's. I'm taking that with me to those people that are in the hospital. You know, and it's just this amazing thing to share that with people I don't even know. You know and how even sometimes people can be just a heart breath away from being dead. And you can pray with them. And even though they have not responded in any way to any, you will see their lips start to move when they hear the Lord's Prayer. And there's just something so innate in them. You know, or when you have a nurse that walks in the room and kind of stands off to the side and the tears are streaming <laughs> down his face, you know. You know that there's something there beyond just two or three people gathered. Yeah. Well, and I just was going to also say when we were talking about why we all ended up here, and then you said you can feel it. That's how I feel when I'm here. I, when I'm here, I can't believe how strong that feeling is of what's I'm, you know, the presence that I'm in. Just how it feels. It's and every time
time I try to explain it because I think I tried to do that at church camp. I tried to explain it. I'm trying to explain it. It never comes out quite how I think it's going to, but it's about how you feel. It's about what you're feeling. Yeah. And it, it is. it's not what inside me, it's around me. Right. And it comes into me. And one of the things I would say about that, too, is that there are times um, when we come to this feeling bereft, um, feeling sad, feeling lonely, feeling alienated, feeling isolated, well, however it is we, we might describe that. And in that moment, it, it is the activity of all of us that returns us to, to wholeness again. Um, it's... it's so, so I, I don't have to do I don't have to do anything but show up. And when I show up in God's presence, God shows up. And that that's the thing that that for me is so amazing. You ever talk to people about one of their fears as being alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It can is be anywhere from the alone. And, and I think that's exactly why um, why we resonate so deeply <clears throat> with this understanding of being made whole. That, that, that aloneness, isolation, alienation, being separated um, is such a deep fear for all of us. That it, it's as if that it's as if our bodies are just broken into fragments. That's what feeling alone feels like, I think, just just being broken into fragments. There's no possible way that I could ever be whole again. And and um, and then I come and I'm with all of these people and and I'm made whole again. And I'm put back together. I mean that's so because we talk about Christ's body broken for us so that we may be healed. It's an amazing sort of thing. So we may be brought back into the, the wholeness of that, of that body, that the fragments of our lives are all put back together. And the reality is, is it never looks the same. That's what new life is. That's what, that's what we mean when we talk about that new life that's available to us in this very moment. It doesn't, it's not gonna look the same. Because we've had to let go of so much stuff as we get put back together again. Right? So we don't look the same. It'll never be the same. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that funeral sermon. What we know as reality has changed. And, and that happens over and over and over again. That's why death and resurrection is, 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 um, is who we are. It doesn't it, it doesn't make sense to us but it is it is our experience it is how we live our lives that that's why it, you know that the um, the reality of death and resurrection is is so palpable the prayer that we pray at night I say these things and, and then we then I can go to them right um, because they're in this book, because it's in this amazing mm -hmm. book on page, um, well, she's finding the page. I, I have a friend that joined the Episcopal <laughs> Church a couple years ago, and she started coming, like, in the fall, and then she was received when the bishop was here in February, and then they moved the end of March to uh, Nevada. And I had given her a book of common prayer. Well, after, there is no Episcopal Church in her town, so she has to go to